and we'll start off by talking about the axial muscles, right? We saw with the skeleton how we had the appendicular and the axial skeleton. Well, the skeletal system, we're going to um, divide it up that way uh, for lab as well. And we're going to have axial and appendicular division. So the axial muscles, now we'll talk about what origins and insertions are, okay? But <clears throat> what the axial muscles will do is basically they're going to provide the much needed support and obvious all right, movement for the axial skeleton, which is pretty much all right, your skull, the vertebral column, all right, and um, the thoracic cage there. Okay, so we're going to see that much of that movement is going to come from these axial skeleton or muscles, excuse me. Okay, also uh, in the labeling today, we're going to go over a lot of the muscles of the face. All right, so we'll see how they play a role in funk nonverbal communication. All right, we'll talk about some of the muscles of mastication, all right, for chewing. Um, and then if we have some time, I'll, I will mention some muscles that help us with our breathing. Primarily, it's the diaphragm, but we do have some other muscles that do help. And believe it or not, all right, our axial muscles will offer some protection, some, <clears throat> to some of our abdominal and pelvic organs. Okay, in fact, it didn't help uh, Harry Houdini, unfortunately, um, but I'll talk about that in a little bit. All right, appendicular muscles are gonna be the muscles that are gonna move your upper and lower extremities, all right? And so they will also be these muscles that will attach from the upper and lower extremities onto the pectoral and pelvic girdles. And you remember those, right? What bones uh, made up the pectoral girdle and what bones made up the pelvic girdle, all right? So again, a lot of this, these muscles are gonna be based on where we find them. So we're gonna go through all this. And if you, this picture, might look familiar to you because it's also going to be in your study guide. If you do use the lab study guides, uh, there's a nice uh, labeling exercise that has pictures of the skeleton uh, of the human, just like this, the skeletal muscles. So we're actually going to go through a lot of these. So you'll actually be, be surprised at how much you'll know. So first, let's talk about origins and insertions. Okay. Um, and in some literature, they talk about uh, not using origins and insertions and just using attachment uh, sites. But I do want to mention origins and insertions in case you are reading some older, older literature. All right, an origin all right, is going to be the less movable attachment of the muscle, kind of like the anchor. All right, the insertion will be the more movable portion. <clears throat> okay, so origin is going to be the less movable. And that's usually, I mean, if we're dealing with proximity, that's usually going to be more of the proximal area, right? When we're talking about getting close to the appendicular, or excuse me, axial skeleton. And then the insertion, right, is going to be that movable component or attachment site for the muscle. There. So you can see here, when we're talking about the biceps brachii muscle, right, and the biceps brachii muscle has two heads, right? But you can see on the coracoid process here, right, one of the heads attaches onto that. The other one, the long head of the biceps, right, will roll along here, the head of the humerus here. So we have two heads. But point being is the origin is going to be this area here for the biceps muscle because that's the less movable area. Where it attaches down here onto the radial tuberosity of the radius here, and that's going to cause movement of your arm, or excuse me, of your forearm there. Um, and so that is going to be the uh, insertion because that's the more movable area. All right, so you can see here talking about the biceps brachii, our origins will be up here, okay, for the long head and for the short head. And then the attachment site will be, you can't see it here, right, which it'll be the uh, radial tuberosity right here. That's gonna be the insertion. <clears throat> All right, what I really wanna talk about though is when we're, when we're dealing with skeletal muscle fibers, you might notice how there might be certain patterns that are found on the skeletal muscle fibers. Now we did discuss how skeletal muscle is striated. And when we get to chapter 10, we'll talk about what actually uh, causes that striation. 
but these striations and the way that they're arranged will create what we call fascicles. You know, that's a group, that's these groupings or these bundles of muscle fibers, all right, that are going to, when we look at them grossly, we'll see that they have a specific organizational pattern here. And so there's four patterns that I want to discuss with you. All right, there's the circular pattern, the parallel pattern, the convergent, and the pennate. All right, so the circular patterns, usually we're going to find these around openings, right, around our mouth, around the anus, all right, in uh, the uh, cardiac sphincter and the pyloric sphincter, all right, those will be circular muscles, they'll be sphincter-like, but when we're dealing with skeletal muscles, all right, we're going to be dealing with skeletal tissue, so those circular muscles will be, we'll see around the opening of the mouth there, and even the opening of the eye, um, you have this one muscle in particular called orbicularis oris, Right, that surrounds your mouth and helps you to pluck your lips. You also have another muscle called orbicularis oculi. And so when you're squinting, when you're trying to close your eyes real tight and squint, right, that muscle will um, uh, close around that opening there. So it makes the passageway smaller. The next muscle pattern is the parallel muscles here. Right, so what we'll see, those fascicles, that arrangement, that pattern arrangement is going to be parallel to the long axis. So a great example is what we just saw here with the biceps brachii. All right, so here you can see the biceps brachii muscle has its muscle fascicles going along the long axis. That's from here to here, that's the long axis. And so those muscle fascicle patterns follow that same direction. They go all right, from one end of the muscle to the next. Right, so that there, we'll see when you um, contract this muscle, right, the center of the muscle, which is called the belly or the central body there, right, when that muscle contracts, that area of the muscle becomes bigger. Right, so the parallel muscles are great endurance muscles, but unfortunately, they're not going to be able to generate a lot of power and strength. All right, rectus abdominis is another group of muscles. Those are your six-pack muscles down in your abdominal, abdominal area. All right, let's talk about convergent muscles. Just like the term says, all right, we're going to see these muscle fibers come from a, a, a spanned out area and converge on one central point. All right, that attachment site is usually going to be a tendon, but it can also be a tendon a sheet or just a bunch of collagen fibers. So it'll look like a big triangle. And so the nice thing about these muscles, all right, are that you can modify the direction in which you're going to pull. And it's done because you will activate certain muscle groups, all right, with or muscle fibers within that specific muscle. So these muscles, all right, <clears throat> are not going to be as strong as parallel muscles, all right? But the great thing is they can pull in several different directions depending on which group of muscle fibers you are activating. And so the pectoralis major muscle, that's that big chest muscle, all right, that sits right on the superior anterior portion of your thoracic cage. And so that muscle group helps when you're trying to pull things close to, uh, or excuse me, push things away from your chest. So football players use it all the time when they're blocking and they're trying to push each other away from each other, okay? And so this muscle group can actually modify its direction of pull. Pretty cute, cool. All right, our pennate muscles, all right, are going to be where we have right, um, a tendon and the muscle fibers will attach onto this tendon at an oblique angle, something like this. It looks like a feather. So obviously uh, these muscles are going to have that angle of pull being generated. So they will be able to generate all right, stronger forces, but they won't have the endurance like we saw all right, with some of our other muscle tissues here. So these types of muscles, the pennate muscles are stronger than our parallel muscle fibers. And so we have three types of those. We have the unipennate, which you can see here that I've drawn. 
And then we have our bipennate. That's the one that truly looks like a feather because you have the muscle fascicles coming off of both sides. And then you have your multipennate where the, the, the tendon kind of splits off into a bunch of smaller tendons. And then you'll have the muscle fibers coming off of both sides. I'm not gonna draw that out for you. I'll show you a picture here. All right, so unipennate, all the fibers are on the same side of the tendon. Bipennate, the muscle fibers are gonna be on both sides. And then our multipennate, right? We get a branch off that tendon and then we'll get fibers shooting off of the off those smaller uh, tendon branches. So here you can see, all right, the different organization features of our muscle fibers. Okay, so we have our circular, then we have our parallel, then we have our convergent, our unipennate, the bipennate, and the multipennate. I hear some nice gross dissections for those. All right, so. Intramuscular injections, ever wonder why it's a good thing for certain types of medication to be injected intramuscularly? Well, a big part of that is because all right, your muscles have a large vascular bed. <clears throat> so if you need to give medication or a lot of medication all right, to a patient or to somebody and you need it to get into it at a nice uniform, even delivery, for that patient, all right, you can give them an intramuscular injection. Uh, the DTaP uh, vaccine is one such uh, uh, injection that you have that's intramuscular. That's why your muscle is sore several days afterwards. Right. So intramuscular is a nice way. It depends on how, what your goal is. If you're trying to give a lot of medication versus a little, uh, if you want to make sure that you can get a nice, slow and consistent, constant delivery, then I would say go with intramuscular. All right. So when we go over these muscles, you might ask yourself, well, these names are complicated, but I'm telling you this right now. If you kind of pay a little bit of attention and understand why we name muscles the way we name muscles, it might help you in learning all right, the names of these muscles because you'll say, oh, I, I get it. I, I see why that muscle is named the way it is. And so that might help you when you're trying to identify some of these muscles. So when we're talking about what we call skeletal muscle nomenclature, how we name them, okay, we're going to name them, all right, a few different ways. The first one is, what does the muscle do? Okay, what's its primary function? Does it extend something? Does it flex something? Because we know movements now, right? We know, right, with our, our uh, in chapter nine, right, we know what lateral flexion is. We know what flexion is, circumduction, right, medial rotation, um, lateral rotation. We know that now. So we're going to see how some of these muscles, based upon what they do, that's what they're named for. Okay, so for example, flexor digitorum longus. Okay, so you can tell from that name that flexor, right, this muscle is going to flex the digits. It could be the digits in your foot, it could be the digits in your forearm, but we know that it's going to flex and curl, all right, um, your digits somewhere. All right, another way that we name skeletal muscles is going to be where we find this muscle. All right, is it on your arm? Is it on your back? Is it on your stomach? Is it on your leg? Okay, so for example, anterior tibialis or tibialis anterior, right? We know where the tibia is, it's down on your leg. Okay, that's the muscle, excuse me, that's the bone that's medial, but it also makes the shin. And so we'll see that if we see a muscle called tibialis anterior, then we know that that muscle is on the front of the tibia. All right, same thing if we throw superficial or profundus. Superficialis is going to be a muscle that's closer to the surface. All right, profundus is going to be a deeper muscle. External and intern, and externus and internus, again, will tell you how close or far away from the surface these muscles are. All right, muscle attachment is the third way that we name skeletal muscles. And so we're going to see, all right, 
where, because sometimes muscles will have several attachment sites. And so usually when we're naming muscles with this technique, we will name the first part of the muscle the origin, and the second part will be, is, will be the insertion. So this muscle here called sternocleidoid mastoid, sterno is referring to the sternum, okay? Cleido refers to the clavicle, and mastoid refers to the mastoid process on the temporal bone. So the first two names are going to be the origin, sternum and clavicle, sternocleidoid, and then the insertion is the mastoid process. So sternocleidoid mastoid muscle. It's a lot to say. So here you can see that sternocleidoid mastoid muscle. So the origin sites are down here on the clavicle and on the, the maneuvering there of the sternum. And then it attaches right here along all right, the mastoid process there. So as you know, the origin is the less movable part. The insertion is the more movable part. So this muscle will play a large role in the movement of your head and neck. Sternocleidoid mastoid. Right, the fourth way that we name muscles are going to be the orientation of the mu muscle fibers themselves. So for example, rectus abdominis, your six pack muscle, tells us that those fibers, because they're parallel muscle fibers, will run the lengthwise portion of the axial region of your abdomen there. Okay, oblique, obviously, we're going to see all right, the fibers going in at an oblique angle. One of my favorites is muscle shape. There's lots of muscles in which we've used all right, shapes to describe the name of the muscle. Okay, deltoid is triangle, is a triangular shaped muscle that sits on your shoulder. Rhomboid, a rhomboid is a four-sided uh, geographical or geographical, geometrical structure. Okay, orbicularis, orbital, so circular. Okay, trapezius, a trapezoid, again, it's a four-sided structure. Brevis, brief, short, longest, long. Okay, so we'll again throw these terms in there. And as we go through some of these, I'll help to explain it and remind you. And you'll start to hopefully understand. All right. Then another way that we name these muscles is how big or small they are. Okay, gluteus maximus, perfect example. That's the muscle in your gluteal region that you're sitting on right now. Okay, that's the big muscle. Magnus, again, another big one. Anything that's named minor, like rhomboid minor, okay, or uh, gluteus minimus. Minimus is the smallest. So we'll see, all right, how we'll throw these terms in to describe the size of the muscle. Also, all right, where the muscles are going to attach, all right, is going to be another way that we'll name these muscles. We talked about the biceps brachii muscle. Biceps brachii, all right, by be, biceps being two heads, all right? So you'll have a tendon for each. You'll have a, a tendon for the long hand and for the short hand. We get down into the thigh, we're going to learn about the quadriceps muscle group. Again, quad is telling you that there's four heads. So again, I mean, really, I don't want you to overthink this, but you'll start to see it as we go through some of these names here, and hopefully that'll make it a little bit easier on you when you're trying to learn. All right, characteristics of muscles. All right, we're going to start off by going over some of the muscles of facial expression. So we'll go over that for a little bit, and then what we'll do is we'll do some labeling. So let's start off, all right, when we're talking about the muscles of facial expression, we're going to include all the muscles, obviously, of the face, but also some of the muscles that you're going to find on your uh, forehead, on the back of your head. All right, so a lot of these muscles are going to either directly attach onto one of the bones of the skull or superficial fascia. What is superficial fascia? We find superficial fascia just deep to your skin. Superficial fascia is going to cover muscles, helps to separate muscles from other tissues. So these muscles will attach either onto the skull bones or that superficial fascia that lays directly underneath the skin there. So you have this one muscle called epicraneus. Now, this is a long, drawn-out explanation, but I feel like I owe it to each and every single one of you. Epicraneus is this huge muscle. And when I say it's a huge muscle, 
it, it covers a lot of, uh, of uh, geography, all right? I was gonna say square footage of your head, but you don't really, square inch, inches of the head, okay? It covers a lot of ground on your head. So the epicranius is made up of, all right, a muscle and then, well, actually it's kind of like two muscles and in between the two muscles is going to be this connective tissue. So the muscle, we call that occipital frontalis. And then the connective tissue, we call that the epicranial aponeurosis. And basically what an aponeurosis is, is just a thin tendon, really thin tendon. So when we talk about the muscle component to epicranius, right, the real, the, the anterior most portion of this muscle is the frontal belly of occipital frontalis. We'll also refer to it as frontalis, okay? But the frontal belly of occipital frontalis sits right above your eyebrows. So if, you've ever, if you're familiar with Dwayne Johnson and when he used to wrestle, he does it in some of his movies, he'll lift one of his eyebrows up people's eyebrow, I think he calls it, okay? So he's contracting the frontal belly of occipital frontalis. So if you do both of them, it'll raise both the eyebrows up. Now the occipital belly is gonna be found on the back down by the, ox, uh, by the occipital bone. So this goes on the back side of your skull. And when you contract this muscle, you can actually make your scalp move around moving your scalp forwards and back. I'm actually doing that right now as I'm talking to you. It looks like I'm wearing a wig when I do that, okay? But that's the occipital belly. So you have the frontal belly like on your forehead, the occipital belly is on the back of your head, and then in between those two muscles is going to be the, ap excuse me, the epicranial aponeurosis. So let me just pull up my pointer here. Here's the frontal belly, okay? This is also known as frontalis. We'll do the labeling here in a little bit. The frontal belly of the uh, uh, occipital frontalis here. So when you contract it, it'll raise the eyebrow. And then back here, that is going to be the occipital belly, right back here. And so in between from the occipital belly to the frontal belly, you have this thin sheet all right, of connective tissue that will connect both of those muscles and that's called the epicranial aponeurosis. All right, some other muscles that you need to be aware of for facial expression are obicularis oculi. Okay, so we just learned how we name some of these muscles. So when we're looking at the name of this muscle, orbicularis, okay, that's the shape of the muscle, or orbit, orbit. Planets orbit the sun. Planets orbit the sun in a circular fashion. So orbicularis is gonna be a circular shaped muscle. Hmm, where's it located? Um, oculi, eyes, okay? So this naming technique tells you that this muscle is circular in shape and it's near the eyes. And in fact, this muscle, when you contract, is going to close your eyelids. So when you squint, Okay, you're going to contract this muscle. Nasalis, hmm, nasalis, nasal, nose. Okay, so this muscle is named after its location. Okay, that's gonna be around the nostrils there. And in fact, when you contract this, no this nostril, when you contract this muscle, you'll flare your nostrils out. So here you can see orbicularis oculi, it surrounds each eye. So when you contract, remember what we said, orbicularis muscles, right, they make the diameter of the opening smaller. So whatever it is that they're surrounding, and in this case, it's the, the eye, it's going to make this opening smaller. So you'll squint. Here's nasalis right here. It sits right on the bridge of your nose here. So when you contract that muscle, it'll cause flaring of the nostrils. <clears throat> flaring of the nostril. That's nasalis. All right, let's shift down to your mouth here. You've got a couple muscles here, orbicularis oris and depressor anguli oris. I'm not gonna go through a how the naming of this. I'll point out certain things, but not each muscle. All right, again, orbicularis oris, 
is a circular shaped muscle around the mouth. When you contract that muscle, it puckers your lips. Depressor anguli oris tells you a couple of things. Depressor, that's its action. It's going to depress where? The corners of your mouth. So it tells you exactly what it's doing, the action and its location, okay? Depresses the angles or the corners of your mouth. So it gives you that frown um, um, expression, okay? So there's the orbicularis oris. You can see it's going around your mouth. So again, when it contracts, it's going to um, make the diameter of the opening here smaller, causing you to pucker your lips. And there's the depressor anguli oris right here at the corners of the mouth. So when this muscle contracts, it pulls the corner of the mouth down, giving you that frown. All right, a couple other muscles that are associated with your mouth are gonna be the zygomaticus major and the zygomaticus minor. Hooray, I get to tell you something about zygomat about major and minor. All right, yes, that name has something to do with the size of the muscle. Obviously, major is gonna be bigger, minor is gonna be smaller, but I want you to remember this saying, the major, all right, is always going to be below the minor or you can see the minor is above the major, but I've always said the major is always below the minor. So usually when you have a major and minor muscle, they're always very close to one another. And if they're close to one another, always keep in mind that the minor is going to be superior. It'll be above the major. And I'll get to that when we start doing some labeling and I'll show you what I mean and you'll never forget it. So zygomatic is major and zygomatic is minor attached to the upper corners of your mouth. So when they contract, they allow you to smile. Now, resorus here, all right, is going to be uh, um, connected to the corners of your mouth, but on the sides there. And so this will, uh, when you contract this muscle, it pulls your lips back, right? Basically tensing the lips, right? It's named after, all right, when you're laughing, right, ha, 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 you pull the corners of your mouth back. So we called it resorus after laughter. Okay, so here's a couple of those muscles you didn't get a chance to see. Here's zygomaticus minor, zygomaticus major, and they attach onto the upper corner of the mouth. Here's resorus. Okay, that's in the lateral portion of your mouth and it pulls your lips back, so it causes tension in the lips there. All right, a couple more muscles here, mentalis, platissima, and the buccinator muscle. Right, the mentalis muscle, this one, it gives you that pouty lip. Attaches onto your, uh, the, your lower lip on the mandible there. And so when you contract this muscle, it protrudes your lip like when somebody, like a little kid, when they're pouting, they stick their lip out. Platissima is the most superficial muscle that pretty much sits on top of the anterior portion of your neck and partially uh, some of the anterior lateral sides of your neck. So it's the most superficial muscle there. And so I'll show you a picture of this guy when he uh, contracts that muscle. It makes his neck like web out here. Buccinator, for those of you that do play any type of wind instrument, even brass instruments too, if you have to blow on something, all right, buccinator is a muscle that gets a really good workout. But we, for someone like myself, because I don't play any wind instruments or any musical instruments, all right, my buccinator muscle, the only time I'm using it is when I'm chewing my food. And it contracts and it holds the food from falling out of your mouth. It pushes your cheeks up close to your, um, your uh, molars there as you're chewing and grinding food. <clears throat> All right. Here's platissima, look at that thing, okay? It's this big sheet-like muscle that sits on the anterior portion here of your neck. Okay? And when you contract it, it, it gives this web-like kind of appearance. Here's the buccinator muscle, all right? This is the muscle that, you know, when you're puffing out your cheeks, it gets quite the workout there. All right, so here's this guy showing us all these different expressions here. Depressor anguli oris, you can see how it's pulling the corner of his lips down here, right? Orbicularis oculi, all right? Closing of the eyelids here, 
Zygomaticus major and zygomaticus minor are going to lift the corners of your mouth up when you're smiling. There's orbicularis oris, again, causing you to pucker your lips. Frontalis is being contracting, causing you to wrinkle your forehead and raising your eyebrows. <laughs> this one always cracks me up. I don't know why. All right, but here's platissima. Okay, you can see he's contracting it and it's creating this web-like appearance here. All right, idiopathic facial nerve paralysis. You know, this is interesting because, um, folks, there has been an increase in reported cases of idiopathic facial nerve paralysis, also known as Bell's palsy, right? So more and more people are, I actually saw a patient uh, that had this, uh, I'd say about two months ago, okay? Now the term idiopathic means we have no idea what the cause is. Okay, we're idiots. We don't know. Okay, so we, if we if something has an idiopathic etiology, it means we have no idea what causes this, but we know what the symptoms are, because basically the facial nerve, which is cranial nerve number seven, that nerve innervates and controls all of your facial facial muscles. And so what happens to this nerve? It somehow becomes inflamed, and when it becomes inflamed, it becomes damaged. And so because of that inflammation, you get that swelling there. Right, that nerve will get compressed. And so it become, the, the nerve is now malfunctioning. And so it cannot innervate the muscles all right, appropriately, causing paralysis. All right, so most often we treat the symptoms. Okay, so if they have that inflammation going on, then we need to reduce that inflammation. Well, what do we do? We give them steroids. Prednisone is great because it helps to reduce swelling. And that's what we use. We give them some prednisone. Takes a little bit of time because nerves are very sensitive structures, helps to reduce the swelling, helps to decompress the nerve, right? And then the nerve can recover, right? It varies from person to person, right? But we have seen an increase, right, in this Bell's palsy. Um, and so, again, um, with the whole pandemic and everything that's been going on, um, so keep your eyes open. Maybe we'll find out what's causing that. All right. Let's talk about the muscles of mastication. The muscles of mastication are gonna be the muscles that you use when you're chewing. They are going to move the only movable joint of your skull, the temporal mandibular joint. The main two that we need to know, there's several others, but we're only gonna focus on temporalis and masseter. Okay, so temporalis is going to be a deep muscle and it's a big fan-shaped muscle that sits on the temporal side, well, not the temporal, well, that is the side of your skull, the temporal and parietal side, all right, of the skull here. And so it will attach from the skull onto the coronoid process of the mandible. Do you remember the coronoid process of the mandible, right? Well, maybe some of you that have taken your test may have seen that on the test, all right? But the coronoid process of the mandible is that shark fin shaped structure on the ramus of the mandible. Then our other muscle of mastication, the more powerful one, is the masseter muscle. This is the one that you get lockjaw. If you get tetanus and you don't uh, uh, treat it, it, one of the symptoms can be lockjaw, and it causes the masseter muscle to go into muscle spasm, and you can't open your mouth. So masseter then, all right, because you can't open your mouth with lockjaw, it elevates the mandible. It basically closes your mouth. So there's temporalis, okay? You can see how it's on the parietal and temporal bone here on the lateral portion of your skull and it attaches right here onto the coronoid process there. And then there's masseter. Okay, that's the powerful, very, very powerful muscle of mastication. So now you can see both of those muscles together, temporalis and masseter. Now you do have other muscles of mastication. You got the lateral and medial pterygoids, all right, they're responsible for the side to side grinding, but again, I'm not going to worry about those too much. All right, um, let's do this. I want to get into some labeling here. And then if we have time, we can always come back and talk more about these other muscles here. All right, so let's, I would like for you to go ahead and pull out your atlas if you haven't. We're going to go through some labeling.
Okay, so now that we've done all these muscles, right, on our um, notes here, now let's see what they look like. Okay, so the first one, okay, is frontalis. This is that one I was telling you about, all right, the occipital frontalis muscle, which is part of the overall what we call um, epicraneus. So you feel free. If you want to write the frontal belly of the occipital frontalis muscle, go for it. If you want to write frontalis muscle, go for it. One of the things I should tell you is on your exam, okay, when it's asking you to identify these muscles and it's pointing to a muscle, you do not have to write out the whole word muscle, okay? Just type in M period. So this would be frontalis space M period, okay? That's short for muscle. So that's okay, you can abbreviate. Normally I say don't abbreviate, but for this, you can, right? So M period is the same thing as muscle. So that's frontalis muscle. Then here you can see, all right, the epicranial apineurosis, also known as the gala apineurotica. Whoops, sorry. So this is that connective tissue that is going to connect the frontal, the frontalis, the frontal belly of occipital frontalis to the um, occipital belly of um, occipital frontalis. Okay, so this is the gala apineurotica, or you can call it the epicranial apineurosis. And then here you can see the occipitalis muscle also known as the occipital belly of occipital frontalis muscle. All right, let's check out one of our muscles of mastication. Here's temporalis. This is a deep muscle. Right, on these models, you're going to see, if now this is a lateral view, but if you're looking at the, well, I'll show you. Right, you're looking at this model here. I want to explain to you, our right side of the model and our left side of the model are different. The left side here is a deeper dissection. This right side is a more superficial dissection. So we basically peeled off the skin and we peeled off all right, the hypodermis and everything else to get to the underlying tissues. And so you can see we have this muscle here. Well, on this side of our model, this muscle is taken out. So we dissect that away. So these muscles, you're gonna see superficial dissections and deep dissections. So normally if you can see bone, that's a deeper dissection. Here, we're not seeing it as deep. I just wanted to point that out to you because when we talk about this muscle here, temporalis, we just talked about it a few moments ago. This is one of the muscles of mastication. This is a relatively deep muscle. So here you can see it here. And then we've got a different muscle. This is called temporoparietalis. That has, we name it for its location. Where is this muscle located? It's located on the parietal bone and on the temporal bone. So we call it temporoparietalis muscle. And it's, this happens to be the more superficial dissection side. This is the deep dissection side. Again, we can see bone. Okay, and then you're going to see around the eyes, the orbicularis oculi external muscle. So basically what this is telling us is when we talk about the external muscles, we're talking about all right, the muscle fibers on the outer edge here. Pretty much all of these muscle fibers here are the external fibers of orbicularis oculi. When we talk about the internal fibers, we're talking about the fibers on the eyelid itself. So you see the difference? This is orbicularis oculi external muscle. This is orbicularis oculi internal muscle, okay? It's going to be around the eyelid itself. All right, since we're talking about orbicularis shaped muscles, let's move down to the mouth. Orbicularis oris okay, are these circular muscle fibers that surround the opening to your mouth. Yes, 
Yeah, what I'd like you to do, I mean, deltoid is, is not the complete answer. So for me to correctly answer that question, Kristen, you should be putting deltoid M period. Okay, telling me that it's the deltoid muscle. I want you to be specific. You got it. All right, orbicularis oris. Okay, here now we're gonna talk about the muscles. Right, that are gonna elevate the corners of your mouth. Here's zygomaticus minor, that's this right here. Let me see if I can try to outline it for you a little bit. Okay, so that's zygomaticus minor muscle. Remember, the minor is above the major. So then right below it, inferior to zygomaticus minor is zygomaticus major. Okay, the major's below the minor, zygomaticus major. Then we have depressor anguli oris. It's gonna attach to the corners of the mouth, make you frown. And then we have mentalis. That's going to give you the pouty lip expression. It attaches onto the lower lip there. There's nasalis, those fibers flare the nostril. And here's our masseter muscle. This is going to cause you to close your jaw, the most powerful muscle of mastication, masseter muscle. And then anterior to the masseter muscle is the resorus muscle. This is the one, the one that we talked about, laughter. So when you contract that muscle, it tenses your lips because it's pulling the corners of your mouth backwards. That's resorus. And then you've got the buccinator muscle. This is the one that's well developed in tuba players. This is the one that helps to keep food from falling out of your mouth. Okay, keeps the food over your teeth as you're chewing. All right, now this muscle we talked about before. This is an example of a muscle that we name it based on the location of the origin and insertion. So sternocletoid mastoid muscle, all right, is going to be this muscle that we find in the lateral and anterior portions of your neck. It attaches onto the clavicle and to the sternum there. And also it attaches onto the mastoid process of the temporal bone. That is going to be the insertion point. Sterno Cledoid mastoid muscle. All right, now we're going to climb down into your neck. So we haven't really gone over these before. So I'll go nice and easy. And if you look at the name of this muscle, levator scapulae muscle, it's a muscle. They, they either had fun or they were um, high on wine. They were probably drinking a lot of wine <laughs> um, because the, the, when I say they're all over the place, I mean, they we're using a lot of the older languages, uh, Latin and Greek. So some of them, you know, you'd always think that if we could start over, we'd probably do it easier, but that was probably easy for them. So the levator scapula muscle tells you what this muscle is going to do. Elevate the scapula. So this one attaches here, you'll see it in the lateral compartment on the side of the neck. But what it does is it attaches onto the cervical spine and the upper cervical vertebrae, and it goes and travels down onto the scapula. They call it the angle of the scapula. I'll show you in a moment here. And so here it is from the lateral side. Now you can see it from the posterior view. And so it's, the scapula is down here. It attaches on the angle of the scapula and it'll help to elevate and lift the scapula up. All right, that's the levator scapula. Then we have our splenius capitis muscle. Capitis has to do with the head. So of course this muscle is posterior to the levator scapular muscle 
and it attaches onto your skull, the cap. So splenius capitis, here you can see it. These muscle fibers are going to go up and out. Splenius capitis. Trapezius muscle, here you can see it from a lateral and anterior view. This is the big diamond shaped muscle on your back. It's the most superficial muscle on your back. So when you peel the skin away and all the fat, right below it in your upper back, you'll see the trapezius muscle. Here's a nice example of it. I'll show you an even better example, all right? This is just showing you the upper fibers here. So you can see on the right side of our model, that's the superficial dissection because trapezius muscle's there. It's the most superficial muscle on your back. All right, there's trapezius. Back to the lateral portion of your neck. You have the scalene sisters. These three muscles that share the same last name. So meet the first sister anterior. Her last name is scalene. So this is the anterior scalene muscle. The scalene muscles will help with respiration if needed. There's the next muscle, the middle scalene. And then of course, the last one is the posterior scalene muscle. Anterior, middle, posterior scalene muscles. All right, that's it for the head and neck. Let's do one more labeling exercise here. I just need to find it. Just kidding. Just kidding. All right. Okay. All right. Let's label all, all of our uh, axial skeleton muscles. Okay. So we're going to talk about the torso now. ABKB, the first one here that we need to label is going to be, all right, not a muscle, but an anatomical structure called the linea albia. This linea albia is the median reference point to the human. It's right here in the middle. In fact, your belly button or the umbilicus is directly in the center of the linea albia. Okay, this is an anatomical structure. This is not a muscle. It's literally a line. And in some women that have been pregnant, their linea alba becomes dark. For whatever reason, there's increased melanocyte activity in that area. Then it's no longer called the linea albia. It's called the linea nigrans. <clears throat> so it's not uncommon for that to get dark. Yeah, see, and some, yeah, some, it's interesting how that happens. Um, but it, again, it'll happen because of, uh, of pregnancy. Interesting. So that's the linea albia. Now let's check out the muscle here. <clears throat> Here's your six pack muscle. There's the rectus abdominis muscle. All right. And again, we're describing the shape of the muscle and where it's located. Okay. This muscle, I shouldn't say the shape but the fiber orientation where the fascicles are going, all right? They're parallel, so they're going straight up and down. So that's rectus. And then where do we find it in the abdominal region? That's rectus abdominis, that's your six pack. So here now what we're gonna do is, let me go back to this. What we're gonna do is we're gonna cut this whole part out and we're gonna flip it over. And we're gonna look at it from the inside. So that's what we're doing here. Here's the rectus abdominis muscle from the inside looking out. <clears throat> and so you can see those fibers run parallel to the linea albia right here, okay? There, it's all parallel to the longitudinal axis. All right, up here you can see we have this muscle called the subcostal muscle. This attaches onto our ribs, hence the, the uh, part of the name costal, subcostal muscle. You might notice that in between, what gives you the, the, that washboard ab that you'll see in, 
in, in people that are in really good shape, muscle uh, bodybuilders and whatnot. All right, you have these structures. Again, these are not muscles. They're connective tissue structures. These are called tendinous intersections. Tendinous intersections. And they're found in between the muscle bellies here of the rectus abdominis. So part of your core muscle group are the oblique muscles. And so the most external of the oblique muscles is the external oblique muscle. Ha ha, hence why we call it external oblique. So the fibers run down and in. So like those pockets that you have in your pants when you put your hands in your front pockets, okay? If you look at your fingers, they point down and in. And so, at, so the same goes for the external oblique muscle fibers. They go down and in. Internal oblique muscle fibers are gonna be a little bit more uh, deep to the external oblique, but those muscle fibers go up and in, like that. Up and in, so that's the internal oblique muscle. Then you have these fellas here, the most internal are the transversus abdominis muscle. Now look, you look at those muscle fibers, they're going side to side here, okay? So hence they are transverse, following the transverse plane. But I want you to notice something. See this line that I just drew? All the ribs are up here. There's no ribs down here. We are in the abdominal area of your axial skeleton. Hence, we call it transversus abdominis because we have another muscle group that's very similar, except it is located above that red line that I drew in there. And we call those the transversus thoracis muscles. We'll see that in a moment. All right, so as major is this muscle that attaches onto the lumbar spine and it starts to descend down towards your thigh. It'll pass in front of the iliac fossa of the os bone there. So that's called the psoas major muscle. Now you can see it on this model here. There's the psoas major muscle. This is the lumbar spine, by the way, right here, your low back. So this muscle attaches onto the lumbar spine and then it travels down towards your thigh. That's the psoas major muscle. Lateral to the psoas major muscle, we have a muscle called quadratus lumborum. You can see it over here also. Right. On the left, the psoas major is obstructing part of it. On the right, we remove psoas major, so you can see quadratus lumborum. What an easy mu muscle to remember. Quadratus tells us the shape of the muscle, and it quite literally is uh, a quadrilateral in shape. Okay, it's got the four sides right here. And then it tells us exactly where it's located lumborum in the lumbar region. So that's an easy one. Quadratus lumborum. <clears throat> Yes, yes, that is in your atlas. I know it might seem like I'm moving through that kind of fast. All these slides, I can guarantee uh, that this is in your atlas. I just can't remember what page it's on. But it's in there somewhere. I know that all these um, models aren't all together. And that's because we use a lot of these same models for other chapters too. Okay, You're going to see this model again when we get into chapter 14. All right, but I promise you it's there. All right, there's iliacus. Here's psoas major, then just lateral to psoas major is iliacus. Iliacus sits in the iliac fossa of our oscoxa. Iliacus and, and uh, psoas major have a special relationship, which we'll talk about not today uh, in another class. Okay? They fuse together and form a new muscle. Cool.
Here you can see Iliacus on this model here. Okay. Then on our back, the deepest muscle group on our back are called the erector spinae muscle. Now you could probably guess what they do. They help keep the spine upright. And so when you go to bend over to tie your shoe and you go to straighten back up, you contract these muscles and they straighten you back up. They also help you to stay straight up. Okay, so those are called the erector spinae muscle. They are the deepest muscle group here in the axial skeleton. There is a great picture of trapezius, and you can just see half of it because we dissected the other half out. Okay, so it's a big diamond-shaped muscle. It goes all the way here and goes all the way down to T12. So it's shaped like a trapezoid. So that's trapezius. Then you'll see this muscle, which is very well developed in people that do the butterfly, which is a swimming stroke, um, rowers, this and uh, people that I always say, joke around and say the Marines, it doesn't mean it can't happen in uh, any of the other service branches, but you use this muscle group a lot when you do pull-ups, okay? This is the latissimus dorsi muscle. Okay, so that is found in, your, in the middle and lower portion of your back here. That's the latissimus dorsi muscle. Then there's our deltoid muscle. This is a muscle that's named after its shape. It looks like a triangle. So we're gonna see it from three different um, uh, views here. So the first view that we're seeing is the posterior view. So these are all the posterior fibers over here. Then on the anterior view, all these are the anterior fibers. So we'll see that on the front. And then we have our lateral view, and that's gonna include all the muscle fibers. So that's the deltoid muscle right there. See, it looks like a triangle. Deltoid, so that's an easy one to remember. That's what gives your uh, shoulders that rounded contour. All right, here's that major and minor uh, situation. So we're looking here at this muscle group that's found in between the spine and the scapula. So the rhomboid major, or you can call it rhomboidus major, either or, here's again, it's shaped like a rhomboid, which is a four-sided geometrical shape. That's the rhomboid major. Right above it is the rhomboid minor. Minor above the major, there you go. Attaches the scapula, the medial border of the scapula here toward to the spine. <clears throat> All right, then we have Teres major that is just superior, it's this little fella here, just superior to the latissimus dorsi muscle down here. It's the teres major muscle. You can see it here on this view. Teres major. Yes, there is a minor, but we're going to talk about the minor when we talk about the appendicular muscles. And here you can see Terra's major. All we've done is, this is the lateral view of your arm or the outside. Now I'm just gonna flip it over and look at the inside. This is the internal view. There's Terra's major. All right, going down to the posterior, well on the back, but the inferior portion in your low back here, Right, you've got this muscle called serratus posterior muscle. Now we call it serratus because right, this area looks like it's serrated, like a serrated knife. Okay, so the serratus posterior muscle sits on the back of your thoracic uh, cage there. 
And you have two, but for our class, I only want you to worry about this one here, the serratus posterior muscle. There's a serratus posterior inferior and a serratus posterior superior. But for this class, just note it as serratus posterior. Okay, so there's the serratus posterior muscle. You also do have a serratus anterior muscle. You can see part of it right here. I'll show it to you in a second. Here's that muscle I was telling you about earlier, the transversus thoracis muscle. And we know it's thoracis because we're in the thorax because we see ribs, ribs, okay? So these muscle fibers go transverse, right? but they're attached to the ribs. So that's the, Transversus thoracis, transversus abdominis is down here, over here. Okay, that's transversus abdominis. All right, pectoralis major muscle, that is that muscle that sits on the front there of your chest on the superior portion of the thoracic cage. That is the pectoralis major muscle. Yes, there is a minor. You don't need to know it for this class though, okay? Then here is the serratus anterior muscle. And so you can see again, this one here, we call it serratus because where it attaches, it gives that serrated appearance, like a serrated knife. That's the serratus anterior muscle. Now you don't have this picture in your slot and your atlas. All we did was, you can see, all we're gonna do is rotate the model towards us a little bit. And so you can see the serratus anterior muscle a little bit better. Again, here's all that serrated boundary there. And that's serratus anterior. Then a couple other muscles of respiration. We have our external intercostal muscles. Those are gonna be the muscles that are gonna be more lateral and those fibers again are similar in direction to the external oblique muscles, they go down and in, like you're putting your hands in your pockets or your fingers in your pockets, down and in towards the center. You can see them, all we've done is just rotated out our model a little bit. See here the fibers running down and in. Those are the external intercostal muscles. Here are the internal intercostal muscles. And so they're going in this direction, up and towards the midline. Internal intercostal muscles. Now, both of those help with respiration. Okay, as the thoracic cavity expands and it contracts, all right, they play a role in that. Here are the inner, internal intercostal muscles there. And then of course our diaphragm. And now we're gonna go over some of the components to the diaphragm. So first of all, this whole thing is the diaphragm, all right? The part that's red is gonna be the muscular component of the diaphragm. That's gonna be the part that's gonna contract. So when you're breathing, that part is contracting. You're taking a breath in, that contracts. This part does not contract. That's the central tendon. That is connective tissue. All right, that does not contract. So, whoops, there's the muscle portion. Whoops, muscle portion. Cent uh. Muscle portion, central tendon. Now we have these holes here. This first hole is the caval hiatus. What is the caval hiatus? That's the in excuse me, inferior vena, excuse internal, inferior vena cava. Wow, my brain just shut down on that one. The inferior vena cava, that's the blood vessel that brings blood to the heart, deoxygenated blood to the heart from the lower extremities. Inferior vena cava. So it pierces through the diaphragm because the heart sits superior to the diaphragm. This next hole is the esophageal hiatus. That's the hole in which the esophagus travels through the diaphragm to get to the stomach, which is inferior to the diaphragm. 
And then this last space here is the aortic hiatus. That's where the descending aorta, right, is going to travel down into the abdominal pelvic area. That's the aortic hiatus. Okay, folks, that's it for the axial muscles. The axial muscles.